Well, the service today or the sermon today is taken from Genesis chapter 19. Well, really Genesis 18, beginning at verse 16, all the way through to the end of Genesis 19. Uh, With that in mind, I'm not going to read all of it, though God willing you've read most of it at home or during your Bible study groups this week. You can follow along with the readings, Genesis 18, 16 to 33, and then 19, 24 to 30 either on the screen or in your own Bibles at home. Genesis 18, beginning at verse 16. The men got up from there and looked out over Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to see them off. Then the Lord said, Should I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised them. And the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense, and their sin is extremely serious. I will go down to see if what they have done justifies the cry that has come up to me. If not, I'll find out. And the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham stepped forward and said, Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away instead of sparing the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people who are in it? You cannot possibly do such a thing to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. You could not possibly do that. Won't the judge of all the earth do what is just? The Lord said, If at Sodom I find 50 righteous people in the city, I'll spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham answered, since I've ventured to speak to the Lord, even though I'm dust and ashes, suppose the 50 righteous lack five. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? He replied, I'll not destroy it if I find 45 there. Then he spoke to him again. Suppose 40 are found there. He answered, I'll not do it on account of 40. Then he said, let the Lord not be angry. I'll speak further. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I'll not do it if I find 30 there. Then he said, since I've ventured to speak to the Lord, suppose 20 are found it there. He replied, I'll not destroy it on account of 20. Then he said, let the Lord not be angry. I'll speak one more time. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, I'll not destroy it on account of 10. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he departed, and Abraham returned to his place. Down to Genesis chapter 19, verses 24 to 30. Then the Lord rained burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the sky. He overthrew these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities and whatever grew on the ground. But his wife looked back, Lot's wife, and became a pillar of salt. Early in the morning, Abraham went to the place where he'd stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and all the land of the plain, and he saw that the smoke was going up from the land like the smoke of a furnace. So it was, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the middle of the upheaval when he overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Lot departed from Zoar and lived in the mountains along with his two daughters because he was afraid to live in Zoar. Instead, he and his two daughters lived in a cave. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> There's a sermon outline there. and You can follow along there. Take notes if you've printed it off. There's a question box at the end of this uh, web page and you can send Neil or me any questions, queries, disagreements even uh, with this passage or what you hear said. Uh, let me be very clear before I begin. There is a huge amount in this chunk of the Bible. I'm not going to touch on all of it. In fact, even stuff I've learned in the last week hasn't made it into the sermon. So please take the opportunity to use the comments box or come by and have a cuppa. Uh, on the veranda uh, at the vicarage, and we can have a chinwag about it. In May 1994, Nelson Mandela became the first black president of South Africa. He was a controversial figure throughout his life. On the right, he was hated as a terrorist. On the left, he was held up as a hero, but many also saw him as a negotiator. He emerged from 27 years of jail at Robben Island to lead the African National Congress to political power in 1994. And a country divided by the legacy of apartheid, that institutional racism that discriminated against non-whites, Mandela's election was regarded with a level of fear and trepidation by everyone. 
What would this man do as a leader, as a black leader of a nation in which the white minority had oppressed the black majority for so long? Well, under the intervention of Mandela, apartheid was dismantled, though it had already studied, started under F.W. de Klerk. Truth and Reconciliation Commissions were established, and even the most reviled activists on both sides were pardoned in an extensive process of national healing. Now, the result is not as rosy as many might have hoped today, but the intervention of one man in that position was crucial for the salvation of the whole nation. Now, in no way was Mandela perfect, hear me clearly. In no way was Mandela the Messiah. In no way was Mandela the saviour of all. But the intervention of one man can have a remarkable effect. And today in the passage that we're looking at, Genesis 18 through 19, we see the intervention of one man on behalf of many, and it's wonderful to behold. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah are a byword uh, in our language for evil and depravity. But here we actually see not just their destruction, but your mercy, hand in hand, your mercy with your justice. Father, help us to see especially the central role of the intervention of one man on behalf of many and the salvation that that brings. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, When Abraham followed the original command of God way back there in Genesis 12, do you remember that in the mists of time? Uh, it, when he followed the command of God to leave his homeland and go to the land that God had promised, uh, he took his nephew Lot with him. And we don't ever know Lot's age, but by the time we see Lot and Abram, as he's then known in Genesis 13, Lot has a significant pastoral empire, a large amount of stock shepherds and the infrastructure that goes with that. Uh, in Genesis 13, once Lot and Abram, as he was then known, have been travelling uh, together for at least a number of months, perhaps even a few years, uh, their competing interests meant that they had to split. Abraham gives Lot the first choice of the land in front of them. Remember that? Uh, Lot, thinking of his business interests, chooses the Jordan Valley, well-watered, fertile, plenty of food. There are warning bells. But when he does, he chooses an area that contains the notorious cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Cities that we're told are renowned for their evil, and he camps next to them. A lot really disappears from the scene after this. Well, Abraham rescues him at least once, doesn't he? But we don't (laughs) really have much interaction with Lot until this episode today. But let's just go back a little bit. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, Abraham has just finished entertaining God and his two companions. It's a pretty remarkable thing to say, isn't it? entertaining the Lord and his two companions. Imagine preparing a meal for God and his two angels. What an amazing thing to have happen in your day. The meal's finished. The men stand up together. They're on a ridge of mountains that run the length of the land of Canaan. If you look out to the east, you'll look down on the Dead Sea. In the distance at the foot of the Dead Sea, down in the south, you can see the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as they stand looking out over that land, we get a glimpse into the mind of God. Look at verse 17 through 21. Then the Lord said, Should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I've chosen him so that he'll command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he's promised. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense. Their sin is extremely serious. I'll go down to see if what they've done justifies the cry that's come up to me. If not, I'll find out. Let me just make an aside. Uh, Whenever you are given an insight into the internal conversation within the mind and heart of God, please pay attention. Uh, They are very rare. Uh, Genesis 1, 26 and following, where God deliberates within himself, I think, anyway, about the creation of humanity. Uh, this is really one of the few other times I can see such a extensive glimpse into God's mind and what he's on about. And that's really what's going on there in verses 17 through 19. And then I think verse 20 and 21 is the Lord revealing that to Abraham. On face value, the thinking is clear. God's pondering about whether to tell Abraham what he's about to do to these cities. 
that God knows that the outcry associated with these cities is loud and proud and these cities are known for their evil. They do not hide it. He's going down there, down there to see if it's really as bad as people say. We're meant to remember, we're meant to remember aren't we, uh, the incident there with the, the Tower of Babel when the, the Lord came down to, to, to look. Uh, at the heart of this are a number of things, not least uh, the consistency of the character of God that's mentioned there a number of times. Uh, there are other many remarkable things, but notice two that are crucial. First, God's judgment is never unfounded. God gets the facts. God judges based on the truth. He's not a judge who judges unfairly. Secondly, how wonderful it is that God, the Lord, should regard Abraham so closely that he would share his revelation with him. That speaks to the closeness of the relationship that God has with his mob, the people that he's committed to. Uh, Well, these two ideas form the foundation for Abraham's response when he hears what God is about to do. Look there in verses 23 through 26. Abraham stepped forward and said, Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Will you really sweep it away instead of spe- what if there are 50 righteous people in the city will you really sweep it away instead of sparing the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people who are in it you know possibly do such a thing to kill the righteous with the wicked train the righteous and the wicked alike you could not possibly do that won't the judge of all the earth do what is just what a wonderful conversation for abraham the man declared righteous by god to speak openly with the Lord. He responds to God's statement by recognising God's character, his fundamental ability to judge the truth of God's judgment. As the judge of the earth, God judges justly. Let me say that again. As the judge of the earth, God judges justly. And so Abraham steps in and talks to God about what he's about to do. Now, God's not unfair in his judgments. God's not varying in his judgments, going up and down depending on the day and which side of the bed he got out of. God's not inconsistent in his judgments. God's not unfair. God is just, reasonable, fair and right when he judges, which we've seen right throughout the Bible up until this point. And on the basis of the character of God, this truth, knowing the privilege of the intimate relationship he has with God, Abraham intervenes. Abraham speaks up. Abraham intercedes. Would God really sweep away those who are righteous as he judges these overwhelmingly wicked cities? It's a wise and brave intervention, isn't it? And it leads to that remarkable conversation between God and Abraham. God listens patiently. Abraham intercedes, intervenes, speaks up passionately, but humbly, respectfully, Eventually they come to a point where God says very clearly, if there are ten righteous people in those cities, I'll spare them. Abraham has a vested interest here, doesn't he? His nephew Lot is down there in that region. The God leaves, his angels head down into Sodom. Look there in verse 1 of chapter 19, and I'm at point 3 on the outline. The two angels entered Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting at Sodom's gate. When Lot saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed down with his face to the ground and said, My lords, turn aside to your servant's house, wash your feet, spend the night. Then you can get up early and go on your way. Now the first person we meet in Sodom is Lot. We haven't seen him since Genesis 14, when he was rescued by Abraham. It was more than a decade before. Now he sits at the city gate. Now that's a really important little fact today because that's where the council sits. Lots high up on the social scale in Sodom. He's a member of the town council. He's a part of the economic infrastructure of the town. He's part of the social fabric of the town. He helps oversee the cities of ill repute. He moved there as a travelling pastoralist. Now he's set down in roots, he's moved in, settled down, part of the fabric of the city, enmeshed in its workings. He offers the angels hospitality. He forcefully offers them hospitality, a lot of debate about that. They accept his offer as they sit down for the evening meal. Look there in verse 4, if you've got your Bibles open, before they went to bed, the men of Sodom, both young and old, the whole population surrounded the house. They called out to Lot and said, where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out to us so that we can have sex with them. 
The whole male population of Sodom is standing there. Where this is an all-encompassing statement here. The whole city. Now the question of God is answered. Is this city as bad as everyone says? Well, it's as bad as God has heard and worse. The whole male population has gathered to abuse these guests. Are there even ten righteous men in this city? Is there even one? Well, Lot intervenes, doesn't he? Lot went out to them at the entrance and shut the door behind them. Verse 6, he said uh, behind him, he said, Don't do this evil, my brothers. Look, I've got two daughters who haven't had sexual relations with a man. I'll bring them out to you. You can do whatever you want to them. However, don't do anything to these men because they've come under the protection of my city. One righteous man. Well, Lot might have come from Abraham's family, but he's lived in the swamp of the sin of Sodom for so long. He's not been discerning. He's not been wise. He's been sucked into the rebellion and evil of this city. He's part of the outcry. Not even this man stands out as righteous. As the city men come and try to replicate what we saw in Genesis 6 as the boundaries of creation were broken and the Lord looked down and said, every inclination of the heart of man is evil. As the men of the city come to do that, Lot reveals that he's just like them. He is as perverted as the rest of the city, just more controlled in how he expresses it. He made an economic decision that looked wise by the world's standards back there in Genesis 13. But what's the cost? The angels intervene, Lot's saved. How amazing that they could save such a man. They then speak to Lot about their job. The decision is made. The evidence is in. The outcry is true. The evil is great. The city is condemned, destined to be wiped out under the judgment of God. For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people is great before the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot, get out. Their words reveal two important truths. There there aren't even ten righteous people in the city. And God's judgment is just and fair. He's seen the evidence. But their words also reveal a stunning question. I mean, after Lot has behaved like that, they're warning him. Why would they want to save that bloke who just offered his two teenage daughters? How can that be? Well, the future son-in-laws are warned. Uh, I presume their response is partly due to the fact that their eyes are still recovering, the sleep dust is there. Well, no, it's because they're humans. They laugh. They think it's a joke. At the crack of dawn, who's first up? I mean, for me, I guess maybe I'm selling myself too highly here, but if there's been a visitation from God that proclaims certain judgment on the city that I lived in and I was told that I could flee with my closest, my dearest and most beloved, I'd be beating the crack of dawn, but who's up first? At the crack of dawn, the angels are are up first. What's Lot doing? Is he waiting for the coffee to brew, the bacon to be cooked? Is he thinking about the investments for the day? No, his settlement in the swamp has affected his judgment. He has been seduced by Sodom, the success that it's brought him. He's hesitating in the face of the clear pronouncement of the judgment of God. How can he do that? Well, the angel's frantic words and actions rouse him, but not swift enough. But look at verse 16. Lot hesitated. So because of the Lord's compassion for him, the man grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, the hands of his two daughters, and they brought him out and left him outside the city. How seduced is this man? He hesitates. What about my blue chip investments? What about the rental agreements and the housing inspections that will happen today? Or what about that motion before the town council next week that will clear that land zoning? He hesitates. He's been seduced by the sin and the evil and the rebellion and the lifestyle that it's brought. It takes the direct intervention of God, the compassion of the will of God, the grabbing of the angels of the Lord to take this hesitant man and his family from the destruction. And God saves him. God intervenes for him. Why? Again, as I leave the city, the angels urge frantic fleeing. Look there in verse 17. Run for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere. Run to the mountains or you'll be swept away. And like, oh, it's too far. God, run uphill. It's too far. 
and he decides to bargain to go a f- less distance that isn't uphill to a smaller town. The man has been damaged, not only his lifestyle, but his ability to know the damage of his lifestyle. The judgment of God is imminent and nigh, and it struggles to break through his attachment to his life in Sodom. And yet again, the messengers of the Lord show his compassion and allow him to move to the smaller town. Why would God act in such a way? For this man. The judgment rains down there in verses 23 to 26 and the sun comes up and the judgment falls and the two cities are wiped out. Their evil was too great. The evidence was too clear. The God's judgment was fair and right and Lot's wife could not bear to leave her home, her lifestyle, her luxury. And she bore the consequence. Early in the morning, verse 27, Abraham went to the place where he'd stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and all the land of the plain, and he saw that smoke was coming up from the land like the smoke of a furnace. So it was when God destroyed the cities of the plain. He remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the middle of the upheaval when he overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Abraham wakes up that morning, I'm at point four on the outline, and uh, he goes to the same place that he stood with the Lord in uh, Genesis 18, verse 22, uh, where they had that conversation. He looks out, uh, the conclusion would have been unavoidable. There weren't 10 people, 10 righteous people in that city. And so God judged fairly. But verse 29 is crucial. We started with the intervention of Abraham, didn't we? And we finished with the intercession of Abraham. Lot was saved. Why? All those why questions that we pose, why would God do this? Why would God do this? Lot Lot was saved because God remembered Abraham. God brought Lot out of the cities where he had risen to great heights and sunk to such great depths. Why? Because of Abraham's intercession. God had warned Lot and his family even as they displayed their depravity. Why? Because of Abraham's intercession. God had seized Lot's hand and dragged him from the city. Why? Why? Because of Abraham's intercession. God had listened to Lot's pitiful complaining and let him flee to Zohar. Why? Because of Abraham's intercession. God saves. But the intercession and the intervention of Abraham is crucial. It's on the basis of that intercession of the one man that God clearly saves Lot and his family. Did he deserve it? Well, listen to his behavior in verses 30 to 38. Just read it and see what this man is like in his heart. Lot is a grub. Lot is a drunkard. Lot and his daughters have fallen from the heights of the city and revealed that they lived in the cesspit, the swamp of Sodom's mindset and heart. There is nothing about Lot that says God should have saved him, but God did. Why? The intercession of the righteous man. Now, there are many striking revelations in this chunk of the Bible. Uh, I've probably not even touched on many of the questions that you might have had as you read it this week. I'm at point five on the outline. There's the nature of human perversion and sin, the compassion of God, the character of God, the judgment and mercy of God, the nature of judgment, the way in which people can be damaged by their decisions, not only in how they live but how they know. All are worthy of sermons in their own right, but I want to focus on this key point, the main point, from verse 29, the intervention of a righteous man. The intervention of a righteous man. Nelson Mandela did intervene for the state of South Africa. I don't think he saved that nation, even though he affected the course of history. Abraham clearly intervened on behalf of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, moved by the place of Lot within those cities. Abraham spoke personally to God. God, listen, God saved Lot, we are told clearly in verse 29, because he remembered the intercession of Abraham. There is nothing in Lot to recommend him. Lot was a man who made decisions based on economics, not wisdom. Lot had clambered to the top of the local government and social tree. Lot's priorities had been warped and damaged by his time in Sodom. So not only his behaviour was changed, but his ability to think clearly was changed. Lot couldn't even take the explicit warnings of the imminent judgment of God seriously. And yet because Abraham intervened, God saved him. 
Now, that firstly, that's got to be a testament to the mercy of the God, doesn't it? Because he is the one who saves. Lot received undeserved kindness, didn't he? When he deserved fire and brimstone from God. Why? Because a righteous man intervened on his behalf. That establishes a pattern, I think, right throughout Scripture of how God's people act. In fact, God says very clearly that the man descended from Abraham who will save the world will intercede on behalf of rebels, Isaiah 53 verse 12. The intervention of a righteous man can and will save sinners because God listens to that intercession. And as a pattern, the intervention of a righteous man, the intercession of a righteous man, as a pattern, the climax is reached in Jesus, the long descendant of God, of Abraham. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. Jesus interceded for sinful humans so that people who deserved only judgment could come back to God. His intercession was his whole life, which he lived as we should have lived. His whole death, where he died what we deserved. His whole resurrection, where he shows that he's paid the judgment of God in full. That is the intercession, the intervention of the righteous man for people like us, like Lot. And that continues, even after his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven. Jesus speaks in our defense. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. We are saved and we do not deserve it by the intercession, the intervention of the one perfectly righteous man, Jesus Christ. The grace of God is applied to us because Jesus came down into the city, saw that the judgment was deserved, and so he steps in. And so as righteous people now, well, that's what Jesus has done for us, He's not just saved us, but he's made us perfect before God because we are connected to him. So as we learn in Colossians, everything he has is now ours. We've got a model to follow. Are there people that you know who do not know Jesus? Are there members of your family who are camped under the walls of Sodom? Are you camped under the walls of Sodom? Are there close friends who scoff at Jesus? Are there people in our town who seem too far gone Well, we're meant to intervene for them. We're the people who must intervene with God on their behalf because Jesus has intervened for everyone whom God has chosen to be his. Our intervention will only be effective because Jesus has achieved it all. And God will listen and God will judge fairly and God will save mercifully. But there's a warning here too, isn't there? The judgment of God is real. God knows the facts. God has seen the reality of our world. God knows what our rebellion has done and he will judge it. And Sodom and Gomorrah will seem like a spark in comparison. Those who do not trust in the intervention of Jesus, the righteous man who lived, died and rose for our sins, will be swept away at that day just as surely as Sodom and Gomorrah was. There is nothing so certain. Now, our world does not like that. Our world needs intervention, the intervention of Jesus, which only he can bring and we can speak into the world if we're righteous. Where else in this town, where else in this community, Will people hear of both the judgment of God and the mercy of Jesus, the intervention of Jesus, if God's mob doesn't speak? That's what we must do. 
And we can do this because as we saw, God listens to the pleas of his people. And so, so let me exhort you, because the one perfect man has interceded, intervened for people like us who face a certain judgment of God, we must intercede and point people to him. Not because we're the saviours, but because Jesus has already done it all. We can intercede through prayer, through praying daily for those we know to come and meet Jesus, for us to speak Jesus into their lives. We can intercede through speech and action, proclamation and practice as we tell people about Jesus and live devoutly before the one who has saved us already. The intervention of the righteous man has given us a message to take to a world that is destined for destruction and to talk to God and ask for his merciful intervention, the intervention of a righteous man. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is the great descendant of Abraham who interceded on our behalf. And thank you that through him salvation is brought to people who are just like Lot. Father, thank you that you've saved your people. Now, Father, please send your people out to speak the same intervention, to point people to Jesus so that they too can be saved. Father, please enable us to do this. In your name we pray. Amen.